Hey, so here in our continuing study of world mythology, the time has come to consider apocalypse. Thoughts on the apocalypse. It's fascinating, isn't it? The, the perennial obsession that seemingly all human cultures have with this idea that we're heading for disaster, <laughs> that there's something up ahead which is going to reduce everything to ash. And in some sense, that's literally true. We know that many millions of years from now, our sun is gonna turn into a red giant and, and expand and completely swallow up Earth. And the planet we love is gonna just be a smoldering cinder and there'll be no life left. And, so, yeah, I get that on a kind of astrophysics scale. We're lucky to be alive. We're lucky to even be on this planet with its paper-thin, breathable atmosphere with just the right temperature and where life forms like us could have evolved. It's a damn miracle, the whole thing, right? And so I get it. It's sort of sensible to acknowledge and to accept the fact that this ain't permanent. I mean, we hope it lasts for the rest of our lives, at least. But it's certainly, I think, smart to recognize that apocalypse stories are profoundly meaningful and important in metaphorical ways. I think we've done a pretty good job, haven't we, of dispensing with this odd notion that myths are to be read literally. Like, what? So what are apocalypse stories for? What function do they serve? And of course, that very useful toolkit that we keep lugging along the trail with us, Joseph Campbell's four functions of myth, the metaphysical or mystical function, the cosmological function, the sociological function, and the pedagogical function. Many or all of those are going to spring forth from our examination of apocalypse myths. But on this question of literalism, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of exhausted by those who claim to be able to predict the future, who keep talking about when the end times will come. And even a brief look at that question online immediately blows up the veracity, the truthfulness of any current day prognosticators who are claiming with great certainty that the world will end on blah, blah, blah day. It's like they have been wrong every single freaking time since the beginning of time. They're going to be right next time. But it's an easy sell, isn't it? It's an easy sell because we're, we're in love with this idea, we human beings, of things ending. You know, Jesus says in the Gospels, before I return, and when I return, he talks a lot about coming back. And so that gets baked into both Christian doctrine and Islamic doctrine that Muslims teach that when the end times come, Jesus will come down to facilitate that process. And in Judaism, they have their own ideas about the end time and the raising of the dead. And, and, and so this is... You know, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It's easy to find an apocalypse story. They're everywhere. Were there real events in these ancient people's lives that kind of broke open the possibility for them that we could be heading for disaster? Of course there were. There were volcanoes, you know, and lava flowed and just turned everything to ash. An isthmus broke and flooded a whole valley and all the villages are now under 30 feet of water. You know, we thought about that with, with our flood story. So naturally it's easy to observe nature and come to the conclusion that we live in a realm of dynamic balance and it doesn't take much to knock it off balance and send the conditions into disaster and make it impossible for life to go on. So naturally, we are a storytelling species and we would take those past tragedies and impending tragedies and um, immortalize them in story form. 
make movies about it, tell write books about it, tell stories about it. And by looking at the horror of that, I don't know, feel a little bit better. You know, the, the, the Greek philosopher Aristotle called it catharsis. And catharsis um, kind of literally means purging. Like, like when you vomit, sorry, kind of gross, but like when you vomit, you're, you're, you're purging something that your body is like, get that out of here. And so catharsis, you know, when we, the way Aristotle analyzed Greek tragedies, he said, why do we love sad stories? Why do we love tragic plays, he asked, where everybody dies and everything goes wrong. <laughs> and we get to the end and everybody's dead and everything's destroyed. Why do we go to plays like that, Aristotle wondered. He's like, hmm. I think it's because catharsis. When we, um, today we might talk about mirror neurons. When we, when we mirror the experience of the protagonist in a story, you know, when we get into what's happening to Harry Potter or Frodo or whatever, <laughs> whatever person in some story, when we're like watching Milan and we're like, we're, we're all caught up in, in, in her transformation and in, in, in her ordeal and her hero's journey we're like living through it with them. That, that's what catharsis means for Aristotle. That's why we love stories. That's why we need stories. I want to cry when I go to the movies, when my loved one dies. You know, I want to feel wretched from an art form because it helps me purge all of this pent up angst and resentment and rage and grief that I'm sick of carrying around that I want out of me. And when I view a movie or when I hear a story, like it helps me purge that crap because I don't, I can't carry it around anymore. It's killing me. So we need these stories. Maybe even we need apocalypse stories to kind of, of about everything getting lost to remind us how precious everything is. And so were there real ice ages? Of course. Our ancestors dealt with cataclysmic changes that destroyed everything, mass extinctions. And so, I'm sorry if this is a little bit trivial or sort of obvious, but things have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I know our own life cycles are big reminders about that. We all remember our childhoods, and here we are, whatever age you are now, you know, I'm in my I'm in my early 60s, so I'm toward the end, you know, of my time on earth. And I don't know how many years I have left. I, I, I feel fine, don't worry. I, I could easily go another 30 years, but it might be 20, it might be 15, it might be 9. I might just have this afternoon left. Who knows? And so as you consider your own beginning, middle, and end, why would not the earth have a beginning, middle, and and end. Is that so outrageous? No, of course not. So let's confront that. Let's tell that story. Isn't that what apocalypse stories are? That we're simply kind of telling the shadow side of creation stories. If creation stories are about order coming out of chaos, then are not apocalypse stories just the shadow of that? Uh, chaos coming out of order or order you know, whatever holds order together, kind of weakening. And then the chaos starts to burst through. You know, like when you live through troubled social times, like we're living through right now, and you feel the chaos kind of bursting out here and there, madness, mayhem, things that just don't make sense, things that are inhumane, things that are unbelievably cruel. It hits you. We're lucky we have as much order as we do. It, it could all be so much worse. Well, the Indians in the Puranas, these sacred texts called the Puranas, um, talk about the end of time and how Lord Vishnu, who is the preserver God, who's, whose dream is the universe, that Vishnu who sends forth avatars like Krishna, like Lord Rama, that's him right there, like maybe even Buddha, you know, Vishnu is a really great God in Hinduism. He's a good God. He, he sustains all of this. He sends forth Brahma to create the universe. Um, in a sense, even Shiva works for Vishnu. He's a big deal. So in the Puranas, we hear how Vishnu is going to destroy all of this. 
it's all going to get turned to ash. And there are long periods of time called ages or yugas in Sanskrit. And we are living now, the Puranas say, in the last age, in the Kali age, K-A-L-I. Let me just read you, a, not the whole Kali, not, not this whole passage from the, uh, about the Kali age, but just a few lines and compare them to the headlines of today. <laughs> compare them to what our politicians are doing. Compare them to what the wealthy elites are doing. Compare them to the plight of uh, ordinary working class folks. See if this sounds familiar to you. Money alone will confer nobility. Power will be the sole definition of virtue. Yeah, isn't that a nice, I don't know, maybe nice is the wrong word. Isn't that a potent description of our current val value system here in the Kali age, where we no longer respect wisdom and virtue. We just think being rich is what it's all about. And if you have all the money, then we give you all the power. And we think you're really smart and important. Well, he's rich, he must be, he must be right. What? That shows that we're in a dark time, a darkening time, where the real virtues of humanity, wisdom, virtue, kindness, creativity, compassion, ah, we don't care about that. We just respect the rich guys in their gated communities. They must be the most important people. Here's another line from the, this passage in the Purana about what the Kali Yuga is like. It says, praiseworthiness will be measured by accumulated wealth. Impropriety will be considered good conduct. Impropriety, being crude and vulgar, will be praised as good conduct. I'm not gonna burden you by naming names today of who I think are good fits with this. I'm gonna leave that up to your discernment. Boldness and arrogance will become equivalent to scholarship. Yeah, should we trust science, the scientific method, logic, reason, evidence, and consensus? Or should we just believe a blowhard who's on TV who talks a lot and tweets a lot? We are in the Kali age when boldness and arrogance will become equivalent to scholarship. When the pretense of greatness will be the proof of it. And powerful men with many severe faults will rule over all the classes of the earth. Ouch. <laughs> oh my goodness. Those Indians, right? They, they, they had a sense of things. Now, does that mean that we are literally in the Kali age and the world is about to end and Vishnu is gonna rain fire down and destroy everything? No, 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 hold on. Now you're interpreting the myth literally again. Maybe something else is meant by this grim description of our vow, of, our, of I don't wanna say it that pessimistically, of this grim description of the value system held by many today, many, not all. I want to leave you with one last piece, a little more positive, from the Prose Edda, this beautiful work of Norse mythology written in Iceland by this guy who was part of the European conquest of Iceland. And he brought, he was part of a bunch of people who brought Christianity to Iceland. And the native people in Iceland were like, eh, they, th these were the last Europeans to have Christianity brought to their shores around the year 1000. You know, the Vikings, right? And, and so living in Iceland basically had come there earlier from places like Nor Norway and the UK. So the Vikings living in Iceland were the last people to get Christianity around the year 1000. And a couple hundred years later, in around 1300, this, this uh, Christian missionary wrote down Norse mythology, the mythology of the Vikings. From, Nor from Norway and all those other ancient sources. That's where we, that, that's the best source for us of Norse mythology, you know, Odin and Loki and all of that, all of that cool stuff, Thor. 
So that comes from a book called The Prose Edda, written around 1300, including, of course, since we're talking about apocalypses today, Rag Ragnarok, which is one of the most vicious apocalypse stories, as you would expect, coming from Viking consciousness, one of the most vicious apocalypse stories of all. And so in the, in the Norse myth of, Ra of Ragnarok, of the apocalypse, of the end of time, this is an apocalypse so fierce that even all the gods are destroyed. Even Odin, the principal god, the one-eyed wisdom god, Odin, even he is swallowed up and destroyed. It is bad. The sun is swallowed up and destroyed. The moon is swallowed up and destroyed. The world tree, Yagsdril, almost is destroyed too. So in this great and total and cataclysmic apocalypse, it ends this way. The earth will rise from the deeps again one day, green and blossoming, and crops will flourish where none were planted. A new sun will take the place of her mother and a number of gods will return to the ancient ruins of Asgard, led now by Balder. Leif and Leifrasir will survive to renew the race of men. They will have hidden themselves securely in Yagstril's, the world tree's, embrace. And the fire of Surt will not scorch them. They will survive on the morning dew and keep watch through the branches above them for the new sun rising. And thus, through its death, the world will be born again. So for my money, I like seeing apocalypse stories as temporary setbacks, not as the final end, but as part of the cycle of becoming. As Buddha said, all forms arise and all forms fade, as it must be. And here's the pedagogical aspect. It is wisdom, is it not, to say yes to that to say yes to the cycles of birth and death and from the dissolution of forms come the materials out of which the new world will be born. You can't stop the perennial urge of life. That never ends, even though the field in which we are born and die will in turn give birth to nourishing crops and then turn into a conflagration of fire that consumes us all. But on and on life will go in ever new forms that we do not even yet have the imagination to see, let alone understand. See you on the other side.